what we can do just to put this all together is remember our y and our x axes for both of these curves were the same. So we had right atrial pressure, cardiac output. Okay, so here's my cardiac function curve kind of as a steeper slope. And then here's my venous return curve. Okay, so there's my two curves. And what's really important here is this point right here. So the point where these two intersect, that is known as the steady state. Okay, so that's the intersection point. And I'm just gonna highlight it because it's really important to remember that that's the steady state. Okay, so that's where the two curves intersect. And this is telling you at this steady state, it's telling you what the patient's cardiac output is and what their right atrial pressure is. So let's just say that at this point, the cardiac output is five and the right atrial pressure is about zero. Okay, so that's this point, zero, and right maybe here is about five. Now what I did here is I kind of color coded this to maybe you know help it make some more sense. So the slope of the cardiac function curve is going to go up with increased contractility. In other words, it's proportional to contractility. It's gonna go up with increased heart rate. In other words, it's proportional to heart rate. It's going to go down when the afterload goes up, inversely proportional. So I did that one in red. I did that one in red because they're inversely proportional. When the afterload goes up, the slope of the cardiac function curve is going to go down. Okay, now the slope of the venous return curve is also inversely proportional to the TPR, which again, the TPR is essentially going to be the afterload. So, you know, one thing you can remember is that, and you'll see this as soon as we go into the next slide, if I change total per peripheral resistance and or afterload, essentially what we're doing is we're just changing the slope of both of the curves. If the TPR goes up, both of the slopes of these two curves are going to go down. Okay, so the intersection is going to be further down. The x-intercept of the venous return curve, remember, this is the mean systemic filling pressure. This is gonna be influenced, like we said, by total blood volume, and this is proportional to total blood volume. In other words, this x-intercept is going to move to the right as total blood volume increases. That makes sense, a higher right atrial pressure when the heart stops beating because they have more blood volume. And we also have venous compliance, which remember is gonna be inversely proportional. If I decrease the venous compliance, then I have veins that are gonna be more rigid, shunting blood back to the heart. Okay, that's going to leave me with a higher cardiac output and a higher right atrial pressure. So that's gonna shift the curve up. And that's with a lower venous compliance. So that's why it's inversely proportional. Okay, so this is kind of your guide, but what I would say, you know, in a board question, and especially when you're timed and you're taking the real thing, you don't have to remember every single one of these. These are good to get you started, just kind of as a, like a legend to put some structure to it. But a lot of these cases, as I'll show you in a second, you really can figure out just from kind of analyzing the two curves and looking at your data points. And I'll show you what I mean in a minute. Okay, just so that we can cheat if we need to, we have our legend here on the bottom. Okay, so we know what's proportional, inversely proportional and what it affects. But let's go through each of these really quickly and let's see if that we can let's see if we can get a rhythm going as to how we solve these problems. So the first one is, you know, the first thing I want to do before we do any of these curves is let's just put a standard kind of cardiac function curve and then a standard venous return curve. Okay? And again, here's our steady state point in the middle. So we'll just use this and kind of go through these different uh, these different uh, scenarios. So first, let's say we have a patient that has an acute hemorrhage. Now, you know, be careful. When they use the word acute or chronic, usually when the word acute is used, you don't really have to worry as much about the compensation that the patient might be having. In other words, if I'm hemorrhaging, right, I'm going to be tachycardic. That's going to be one of the first signs of hemorrhagic shock. The only thing I want you to look at is the disruption. Okay, just look at what is the number one disruption. Don't give me seven things, just what's number one. And I promise it makes it so much easier. Acute hemorrhage, what's the number one problem? Loss of volume, right? You're losing blood volume. Okay, now the question is, how does that impact this curve? It's primarily just going to shift my venous return curve to the left. Okay, it's just gonna shift the venous return curve to the left. The idea here is, again, if I'm losing blood volume, if I stop the heart, I have less total blood volume, so my mean systemic filling pressure is gonna be decreased. Okay, and remember, this doesn't really affect the cardiac function curve. So the point for acute hemorrhage is gonna be somewhere around here. Now, let's just say that you had a, you know, a board question and they're giving you points over here and over here. 
you know, right off the bat, I mean, you can rule these points out. If you have points that are suggesting a higher cardiac output in the setting of acute hemorrhage, that's just not going to happen, right? You're going to have a lower cardiac output. You would expect to have a somewhat decreased right atrial pressure as well because you're losing blood volume, okay? So that's where you have to ask yourself the question, does it make sense? You know you're going to shift downward and to the left to some degree in acute hemorrhage, okay? Ask yourself, does it make sense? You know, you might have to pick between two closer points and you might be saying, okay, well, Dr. R, technically, you know, heart rate, the patient's going to be tachycardic really quickly. You know, wouldn't that change the slope of this cardiac function curve? And, you know, I would say, sure. You know, if I wrote, if I drew a cardiac function curve and I said, yeah, maybe we increase the slope a little bit because the patient's probably tachycardic. You know, maybe it looks something like this. And then our point is here. It still doesn't change the fact that the curve shifted downward and to the left. Okay, so that's the big point. Don't lose the forest for the trees kind of thing on these curves. You're not getting a PhD in physiology, at least most people that take this test are not, right? So you don't have to be so precise. You just have to have the general idea of what's happening. I have less cardiac output. I have less right atrial pressure. I'm losing blood volume, okay? Now, if I gave the IV fluids, what's gonna happen if I gave my IV fluids? Okay, so yeah, so the curve's gonna shift upward. Now it's just gonna, it's literally just going to do the opposite because now I have more total blood volume, right? So my point is gonna be somewhere up here. We're gonna shift up and probably to the right a little bit. Okay, so somewhere around here. It's probably what I would expect if I gave the patient fluids, if I increase their blood volume. And again, you can make up a whole bunch of things. Oh, I gave the patient a bunch of fluids. Maybe that would lower the heart rate a little bit. Sure, it's possible, but don't worry about that. What's the disruption? What's changed? the blood volume, right? Focus on the blood volume and then ask yourself, does your data point make sense? Okay, chronic systolic heart failure, the disruption primarily, what is it? Systolic heart failure, right? So it's gonna be contractility is my number one disruption. Now, again, like I said, be careful. When they say chronic, you're kind of forced into weighing in some of the long-term factors, such as um, you know what's gonna happen to this patient's uh, afterload over a long period of time or their total blood volume. Okay, so when you see chronic, make sure that you take some of these compensatory factors into consideration. But the general idea here is, you know, where I would always start is, okay, what's going to happen? I'm going to have a decrease in contractility. That's primarily going to affect the cardiac function curve, right? It's contractility. It's going to affect the cardiac function curve. And we know that it's proportional to the cardiac function curve. So I decrease contractility. So I'm probably going to end up with a curve that looks something like this. Okay, so this is my cardiac function curve. I have some loss of contractility. That's the number one problem. Now, if you do this, you know, that's already going to win you more than half the battle, okay? Because now the question is, is there any change in the vascular function curve? And in general, there probably is going to be some changes. If it's chronic, the patient will most likely uh, have a higher total blood volume. And, you know, we see that in heart failure all the time. You see peripheral edema, uh, overall higher uh, blood volume, but less effective circulating blood volume, which we'll talk about in the heart failure video. And you probably would also see a higher afterload. So, you know, all those things being said, basically what we're saying is that the mean systemic filling pressure is probably going to be more out here. Okay. It's going to be more out here. The higher afterload will also cause the slope of this to be a bit lower. So it might be something like this. Okay. Just drawing out a rough outline here, your intersection point will probably be about there. So the point here is our overall steady state is shifted downward from the baseline and it shifted to the right, okay? So that's what you would see in a patient with chronic systolic heart failure. And again, just to write this out, the number one thing to know is that there's a decrease in contractility. That gets you more than half the battle. That tells you that you're essentially moving right. You can figure out the cardiac output is gonna be lower. You can figure out you're gonna go down, right? You're in chronic systolic heart failure. So that's that makes it easy. But if you really wanna add in some of these variables, you can say, well, technically I would expect my TPR or my afterload to be elevated, that's gonna mostly be due to RAS stimulation, which would also cause an increase in total blood volume. And we'll talk about all this in the heart failure video and the uh, video on RAS system physiology, okay? But that's the idea. Like I said, if you just figured out that your contractility is lower, cardiac output's lower, I mean, you already know pretty much where you're gonna be, okay? So that's the concept. Now, if I use digoxin, right, that is just going to be the opposite of the chronic systolic heart failure. Okay, so if I increase contractility using digoxin, what's gonna happen? If I increase contractility, my cardiac function curve is actually gonna go up in slope. Okay, so I'm gonna be more over here from my baseline. 
So I might be right about there, okay? If I use digoxin, I would expect to shift to the left because of the increased contractility, and I'd be a little bit higher up. I'd have a higher cardiac output. That's where this black curve would be my baseline, right? So I'm crossing my, my baseline venous return curve with a higher slope cardiac function curve. Again, all of these, remember, are all at intersection points, okay? The only one that we had to change both curves for so far was the chronic systolic heart failure, okay? But most of these, you, you might change a curve or two, but I'm drawing a lot of these at intersections, you can see, with my baseline curve. And I know this is getting kind of complicated, um, so why don't we just erase some of these just and start over just so we can see the last two. So again, here's my steady state point, okay? And let's just look at what happens with phenylephrine and hydralazine. So phenylephrine, remember, is going to increase the total peripheral resistance, okay? It's in primarily an alpha-1 agonist, okay? So it's primarily gonna act at the site of these arterioles. And remember that afterload and TPR are actually gonna be in both equations for this cardiac function curve and venous return curve. So it's going to lower, if I increase the afterload, remember it's inversely proportional, it's going to lower the slope of both of these curves. Okay, so here's my cardiac function curve, and then my venous return curve. Remember, when I change the TPR, it doesn't change the mean systemic filling pressure. Okay, it doesn't change that, it just lowers the slope. And you can see what's happened here. My new uh, steady state, if I give this patient phenylephrine, is going to pretty much be, you know, down maybe a little bit to the right, potentially, but it's mostly shifting down because both slopes are changing. Okay, so generally we're shifting in the downward direction, but both slopes uh, are going to change. That's the most important thing to remember. Now, if I give hydralazine and I lower the total peripheral resistance, okay, so if I give hydralazine and I lower the total peripheral resistance, I'm going to raise the slope of both of these curves. Again, not changing my mean systemic filling pressure. So I'm gonna end up somewhere up in this region. Okay, so I'm shifting upward. Ask yourself, right, if I give the patient hydralazine, my TPR is going to come down. So I expect the cardiac output to be higher. And so like I said, a lot of this should make some sense. I have some minor changes in the right atrial pressure, but overall the major change when I give a patient, uh, you know, an alpha-1 agonist, or if I give a patient you know, something that's gonna decrease the TPR, the major change should be in the cardiac output. My big takeaways for you are, again, look at the disruption. Just focus on the number one, uh, you know, concept in terms of the disruption. Yes, when there's chronic, conditions, you might have to factor in some compensation to get to the right answer. But to even put yourself in a position to get the right answer, just focus on the disruption and understand the basics of how these curves move. Okay, if you do that, you, you have, you know, 80% of it down. At that point, you just have to ask yourself, does my data point make sense?